welcome to Messy Modern Ministry, a resource where we equip leaders to navigate the ups and downs of ministry in our modern world. My name is Kristen. And I'm Joe. And we are so excited to have you join us today. On this episode, we have part two of our conversation with Pastor Mark Schilling, campus pastor of Redeemer Church in Rome, New York. Be sure to check out part one because we're going to be picking up right where we left off. Enjoy the episode, guys. God builds the church. Let's just be really clear about that. God builds the church. I don't. He lets me jump in with dad's project, but God builds the church. And I think that that allows me to put my phone on vibrate when I'm on a date with my wife for two hours and not have to feel like I'm on call for every stupid petty thing that someone feels the impulse to text their pastor about. And I was that guy. And it did take a toll on our marriage early on. So take it from me, young folks that are about to get married. Like there, you, there's when you're switched on in ministry, be switched on, you know? So if I'm at the church and it's Sunday morning and I'm busy, my wife knows, knows not to come bother me about what do you want to have for lunch? I mean, we ain't talking about that, right? I'm switched on. But when I come home at night, she also expects me not to be staring at my phone and, and engaging in in the minutia of ministry that never ends. It's like it's like a, like being a pastor is like being a farmer. It feels like like you can take a day off from milking the cows, but you're gonna have like problems tomorrow. You know what I'm saying? It's like it never ends. One of the things I, I talked about here with you guys was the principle that we we sleep. Number one, we actually have good, healthy, restful sleep. I literally almost neurotically measure my own sleep. I wear a wrist monitor. I'm not joking. Like, am I sleeping well? And a Sabbath is another a sin of the 10 that I think pastors commit a lot, you know, where they do not have a Sabbath of, of a place of rest where they turn it off. And by the way, I, I people say, oh, can we meet on Monday? Oh no, that's my Sabbath. And I actually say that to them or they'll call. And I don't return a call for four hours and I'll say, oh, I was, I, was, um, I was with my wife or I was tucking my kids into bed. What I'm trying to say is being a pastor is part of my life. It isn't my entire life. That's good. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And I'm trying to model to them, hey, pastor has a Sabbath. Now I'll meet if there's an emergency or whatever, of course. But if it's like, hey, can we get together? My wife's annoying me. Well, we can do that on Tuesday. You know, we can do that on Tuesday. Yeah. And, and so I think sleep and Sabbath are two big things to creating real, real sustainability. It's funny you said sustainability because I was thinking those are some great ways to create a sustainable ministry. Sleep, Sabbath, but what are some other things that leaders can do to create a sustainable ministry? Yeah, I think, you know, I, I don't know exactly who your audience is, but I think that um, we have to embrace anonymity. I think that there is a, a, a real pressure for celebrity in ministry that is so antithetical to the gospel that it's being modeled in a way that we've never had the ability to model it before because of social media, that we can misunderstand what is the guts of, of ministry. The guts of ministry is doing things that no one will ever see. The deed is all, the glory is nothing. You know, I, I posted that video, that little girl, of me praying for that little girl and I never do stuff like that, but the mom and dad asked me if I would, so I did. And people are like, that's amazing. And I'm like, I do that all the time. Pastors do that all the time. I remember there's like a couple of young guys I'm raising up in the ministry. And um, I had to be there when um, a girl that was in my youth group, actually, her mom had a massive stroke and they had to pull the plug on her mom. And they wanted me to be there when they did that and when she passed. And so what I did is I took one of my young guys that's raising up in leadership and I brought him and he watched the whole thing with me, walked it out with me. And I walked out, I said, are you going to tweet about that? Are you going to put that on Instagram? He goes, of course not. I said, exactly. Because the real guts of ministry is anonymous. It's not celebrity. And if you're striving for celebrity and likes and tweets and shares and invites to conferences, you're just, I, number one, I don't know if you're understanding what ministry is. I'll say that. And I'm also saying you are in a, a course towards burnout. I remember we delivered this home. They had nothing. And we delivered air mattresses because the three kids were sleeping on the floor. And getting in the car, and my, and my son goes, Dad, they have nothing. They have nothing. And I said, yeah, I know. That's why we're here in the city. We, we're going to love these right. people. You know? And it's like, trust me, that's going to be in his soul forever you know 
I think that pastors, young leaders, if all they're seeing is someone's national Instagram page as the, as the measuring rod of ministry, I think it's, it's, it's a false sense of what is real. It's cool when I get to post photos of giving away food to the poor and stuff like that. That's cool, you know, because uh, I think that, I think the church needs to see that, the city needs to see that. But then there's an intimate part of ministry that, and by the way, it takes a toll on you. It takes a toll on you. I, I hate seeing ministers. Listen, we're not all called to minister forever. Some people minister as a pastor for a season, but I always hate seeing people leave uh, because of burnout. You know, I I, I just I experienced this um, when I came home from that little girl's bedside and God really did give me grace to be with her, but I was exhausted when I got home. And so I went for like a 20 mile bike ride when I say emotionally exhausted, obviously. So I'm like, that's how, that's how I just like go decompress. And my wife's like, yeah, just go do that. Just, just go get, take off, you know, just go clear your head. Uh, but in the past, like, no, nope, I'm good. Let's go. I'll just keep going, you know? And, and that made me funky and weird. And if you don't know how to balance that out and you don't know how to, you know, like care for your soul, like you said, Kristen, like, I think that you, I'm a, I'm like a hardcore, let's just keep going type of guy, but I'm still human. And I've learned through the years to really say, Oh, no, that, that, that stung. And I'm going to pause and I'm going to say that, that, that took something out of me just there. And, uh, you know, the Bible says when we get to heaven, he will not say, well done, good and famous servant. Faithful. Yeah. You were, you were faithful. And we have to just simply saying, how do I be faithful with what's in my hand? That's all God's asking to do. And for you to say, Lord, was I faithful today? As a pastor, that has to be enough. Not did anyone notice, did anyone see, did anyone appreciate, did anyone this? It has to be simple like I did it to be faithful. So I think that's a sustainable piece for sure. You're not doing these things for the recognition. There's this level of anonymity. Going to bed at night saying, Lord, was I faithful today has to be enough. And I would take it a step further and say, not only do people not always see the good things that you do, but sometimes you're pouring yourself out and they still have a negative thing to say. They still don't agree. And so to be able to, you know, lay your, your head on your pillow at night and forget all of the other societal outside, what people have to say for you to be able to say, Lord, was I faithful today? Like that has to be enough sometimes. That's it. And then, you know, I think too, we need a very small circle in our life that are not haters and they're not fans that will be honest with us if we're off. If we're self-deceived and we don't see it, that will come and say, hey, Mark, can we talk? You know, I call them sit down and shut up people that can tell me to sit down and shut up and I let them speak truth to me. And they know they can do that. And I have explicitly invited them into that role in my life. We all need that. And when you're married, I'll just tell you, the number one person ought to be your spouse. I can say, hey, hot shot. Let me just tell you a couple things, you know? I know I'm in trouble when my wife calls me Pastor Mark. For for those of you for those of you listening because we don't have video, Christian just like stared at me. <laughs> like, 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 <laughs> if, I get a, if I get a little lippy or I get out of line, the house was like my wife will say this, okay, Pastor Mark, and I'm like, oh, uh, okay, 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 you know. But you know what what is, what is she doing? I always say this. I go, we have the Holy Spirit as a still small voice until we get married, and then we have a wife who is a loud voice of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> In our life, you know? still a voice of the Holy Spirit. That's what I said. It's the loud voice of the Holy Spirit, and and so I, I think I think my point is we have to listen. If you're single or whatever, we we need we need voices that will speak truth to us, and then we have to drown out a lot of other voices. Like I I, I don't know when everyone's going to hear this podcast, but right now we're in just a tumultuous time as a nation with racial issues and. As as a pastor and a spiritual leader, I'm trying to be in the front and have the conversation can't win like the one side's like you're not supporting me enough and the other side's going you're not supporting me enough i'm like well, who is it i mean i i mean it's like and listen you've all been sucked into the interwebs and and the, the conversations where you're just my wife's like just don't do it mark just don't do it just don't do it you know right. um, but sometimes i just can't help myself and the thing is when i go to bed at night i have to say okay am i proud of what i posted can i stand behind what i posted you know i think we have to have like you were saying, am I okay at the end of the day? And can I add one more thought? You're ready. You're probably not going to expect this, but some pastors need to just get a life. 
No, I'm serious. I love like, it. Like a hobby, join a dart league, like do something that's absolutely has nothing to do with ministry at all. And don't right. feel bad about it. Don't feel bad about it. Get a life. Like if all your sermon illustrations are about that time you were making a sermon, like you don't have a life. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> like, like a lot of times we get so like sucked into this vortex of ministry that it's like, sometimes we just need to like go rent a canoe and just enjoy a minute, you know? And that has actually helped me. I got into running bigger uh, in my twenties because of someone giving me this advice. And I just like, unapologetically started to say, I just enjoy doing this. Well, how does that build the kingdom? Well, it helps me be healthy. And when I'm healthy, I'm sustainable. And someone said this, ministry, in ministry, you have to set a pace for which you can finish the race. And mm -hmm. as a marathoner, I'll tell you, everybody can start a marathon. Anybody can start a marathon. It's the finishing <laughs> that's hard and it's the finishing that matters and so a lot of times and i i've raced probably well over two thousand miles worth of races at this point and and, I, and you learn over time you come out of the gate you're excited your adrenaline's going and you're on a six minute mile well i'm not a six minute miler you know what i mean that's just way too fast and then you know, it's like six minutes seven minutes eight minutes nine minutes it's like i'm walking you know it's like <laughs> because i i didn't set a pace pace, a rhythm. And the rhythm that God has, and I'll kick it back to what I was saying about Sabbath is six and one, six and one. It, it, you can't just go all the time. And again, to reiterate Sabbath and, and to illustrate from my running experience, someone gave me this advice. The problem with the runners is because, because when you run, you do different types of running, you do hill runs and you do fast runs and uh, long runs and, you know, easy runs. They said this, the problem, the reason you're not making progress, Mark, is you're running too fast on your slow days and too slow on your fast days. Let me say that again. If people are listening, let's talk about Sabbath, right? On your days where you're supposed to be working, you're not working hard enough. And the days where you're supposed to be resting, you're not resting hard enough. And, it, and that is what God has ordained, six and one. Work hard for six. How can you, if you look at the Jewish model of Sabbath, they literally did nothing. Hey, what's to eat, mom? Good thing I had been preparing for six days for this moment because we don't cook on Sabbath. We don't clean on Sabbath. We don't do, but it took six days of preparation to enjoy that one day of rest. The thing is like setting a pace to finish the race is so important. I have a young guy. He was 23, single when he got into ministry. He's, he took over for me as a youth pastor and he wasn't taking a Sabbath. And it didn't matter to him. He lived with his mom and dad and, and, you know, had no pressures of family. And I said, get used to doing it. I go, go fishing, get in a tree stand. Take the, I want you to take an entire day off. And he did. He really, he started to honor the Sabbath. He didn't need to, but I said, you're going to have a wife one day. You're going to have kids one day. If you don't find rhythm, you know, your family's going to resent you. You've got to find a rhythm. And now he is married to a great girl. And he had already learned that, okay, my day off is my day off. And he is, I'm proud to say, I believe he is setting a great pace to finish the race of ministry that he's on right now. Once you're burnt out, it's harder to kind of catch up. Totally, exactly. I started doing ultra marathons, like 50 mile races. And uh, I made a huge mistake of, I don't know how I showed up dehydrated to a race. And after eight miles, I had blood in my urine, which is, bad <laughs> you don't want that um and i was actually being paced by a race doctor he's a doctor and i showed it to him and he's like yep you're really dehydrated the problem is i was behind the curve now i was trying to drink but now my body was not wanting to take it and it took me another 42 miles before i could have anything working again because i had so I got behind the curve. And that's why they say you have to drink before you're thirsty is what they say in running. And that's a great ministry. That's a great ministry of mantra is drink before you're thirsty. I think by the time you're thirsty or your wick starts to turn black, you're, you're late, you're late to the game. And that's where I told um, you that I have burned out two and a half times because the halftime was I caught myself before it was too late. How do you identify it? 
and start rejuvenating yourself, refreshing yourself before you are at a place where it's so much harder? You know, that's a great question. You know, as a pastor, one of the biggest frustrations I feel is people show up in my office and it, it's like they took their life and crashed it into the side of the mountain. And they're like, hey, can we chat? It's like, why didn't you call me <laughs> when you were still in the air and there were idiot lights going off on the dash of your life? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so it's like a lot of times we're ignoring what I call idiot lights in your car. Like, what's that light mean? Oh, I don't know. Let's just cover it with some electrical tape and ignore it. Well, that that's not a good idea. You know, you have to pull over while the engine's still running and address it. And because there's a, there are steps to this. It's not like one day you're fired up for the Lord in ministry, the next day you want to quit. There is a process, but a lot of times it's happening subterraneally in your, in your spirit. But there are ways to identify it because in a healthy mode, right, we are enthusiastic for fill in the blank. Uh, marriage, ministry, kids, the future. You're excited. You look to the future with hope. Um, but then when that disappears, stagnation can start to set in. That's the second step where you're going in the wrong direction where it's like, yeah, that's, it's Monday. You know, it's uh, here we go again. You got to do what you got to do. And then it's frustration. God, I, I, I can't believe I got to do it. Another board meeting. I can't stand it's so annoying that I have to put up with another frustration. And that can express itself in a lot of different ways. And then the last is apathy where, you know, it's actually the opposite of enthusiasm. It's just like you're, it's like, there's, there's just no anything. It's just like you're going through the motion. And so I think you have to start here. Everyone who's listening, are you enthusiastic? Are you fired up? We have bad days. Don't get me wrong, but I'm talking about protracted periods and times where there's just not excitement. Everyone who's listening should be asking themselves right now, if you're in ministry of any kind, whether it's vocational or you maybe you volunteer uh, twice a month, are you excited about that? You should be. I was glad when they said to me, let's go to the house of the Lord. But when I'm like, okay, here we go to the house of the Lord. Like, are you enthusiastic? Right there. If you're not, this podcast was for you. And we have to start leaning in and saying, Lord, what's going on? Why are you that way? Well, there's a lot of different answers to that. All three of us are talking and we could all say, oh yeah, none of us feel enthusiasm. Well, the reason why for each one of us might be different. And thank God who gives us the Holy Spirit as our counselor. If we say to the Holy Spirit, Lord, why is this? Why am I not feeling the joy that I once felt? I really believe he's faithful to speak to you and, and start to respond. Yeah, that's really good. Pastor Mark, are there any resources out there that you know that have helped you that you might want to share with the people listening? Well, if I'm honest, there's a ton of great Christian books. I love Reset by David Murray. Um, it's an easy read, and he helps to not only identify uh, burnout, but also kind of gives corrective measures to take based on what you're experiencing. And he'll say, if you're feeling this, it could be because you're thinking about this wrong. And I like that, but there's a ton of things. I think the most important thing is to get out of denial that you are immune from or exempt from the possibility of burnout. Ministry has ryth rhythms, ups and downs, ebbs and flows. And there are times when you will feel burnout, but we don't just embrace that. We, we, we lean into it. We, we acknowledge it. And we start to resource ourselves. For some, it might be as simple as a book and some fresh time in worship. And you're like, okay, I'm back. Others, it might mean a counselor. Others, it might mean a sabbatical. Everyone's different. But I think simply acknowledging it is the biggest first step to say, huh, maybe I, we were talking to and people are listening going, I never thought about it. And that's what happened to me. I read a book and I wasn't thinking about it. But when I read the book, I started thinking about it. And I started really addressing it. And by God's grace, I'm still here in ministry. So I, I think that burnout, I think, is going to be a part of everyone. Some level of burnout is going to be part of everyone's story in ministry. The question is, is it going to be a part of the ministry or the tombstone on your ministry? My prayer for everyone listening is that burnout would not be your tombstone. It'd be a moment that God will use to make you lean into him and grow stronger. That's good. Pastor Mark, this was a pleasure to record and a very enjoyable episode, I think, for both myself and Kristen and everybody listening. If you guys would like to get in touch with Pastor Mark, 
or any of the Redeemer pastors that we've interviewed, you can go to myredeemerchurch.com. So Pastor Mark, thank you so much for being on the episode. It was a pleasure. You're welcome. Thank you, guys. Hey guys, thank you so much for listening to this episode. If you want to hear more, make sure you subscribe. Also, we would love to hear from you. So down below, you can leave us a review or a comment. Yeah, and you can also follow us on Instagram or Facebook at Messy Modern Ministry for any teasers or updates on future episodes. Have a great day, guys. Bye. <laughs>